Hi, and welcome to Axel Bank Reports History and Today Conversations with America's top nonfiction authors and why their books matter right now. I'm Evan Axelbank, and today we're going to speak with Paul Fisher, the author of The Man Who Invented Motion Pictures A True Tale of Obsession, Murder, and the Movies. This is his second book. He's also a journalist and screenwriter. Paul, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Before we start our interview, I want to invite listeners to our Patreon page to ask for your support in keeping the show going. Go to patreon.com slash History. We will donate part of your contributions to a charity for children's literacy. When we think of the movies, we here in America, at least, think of Hollywood. But if we want to go back to the first movie, we have to go to Western Europe. That's where Louis Le Prince invented a camera that could capture 12 frames a second and make the previously still come alive. After he got the patents for it, but before he could take the credit, he disappeared, like a special effect that is now a cliché. Soon, the Lumiere, the Lumiere brothers, I hope I'm saying that right, and Thomas Edison swept in, unveiling their own devices, and the rest was history until now. Paul Fisher has figured out some of what happened to Louis. But first of all, Paul, where did the word movie come from? I, it's, I think it's as simple as a shortening of moving picture um, or moving image. Um there's there's less debate over that one than film i guess film there's all these these debates that like edison and the people who worked for him invented film because they were the first ones to use the term and edison used to claim he was the first one to use the term but had been around a long time um but i I guess the terminology kind of came about in in an ad hoc kind of way because the technology kind of came about with people feeling their way through the dark really uh, it's a great way to uh, describe what you're going to see. You're going to see movies. Things are going to move in front of me. Uh, Louis Le Prince was a Frenchman living in England in the late 1880s. He did a demonstration of his new magic camera in 1888 for his family. So what was happening in science, both in Europe and in America, that led to this idea that he had? In other words, what were the scientific seeds for this idea of having a camera that could capture motion? It was kind of the culmination of a whole century, right? Like in a sense, the 19th century, the industrial revolution, it it's kind of this period where every other day, it seems like the uh, scientists, innovators, inventors are managing to do something new. And every new thing would very clearly open the way to the next new thing. So in... Le Prince's case, or in moving pictures case, you can kind of trace a through line where in the 1840s, photography is invented. So people can take still pictures. Um, And it's very early, and you can mostly take still pictures of um, environments and landscapes because you need your camera not to move because it takes a minute to take a picture. It takes 40 seconds to take a picture. So the the second that happens... There are plenty of people who think, oh, if I could take this thing, but I could make it to the exposures away quick enough that I could photograph a person, then I could make money because people want to see themselves. Um, That's why people pay for portraits. Um, So then people start trying to figure out ways to cut. I mean, people, uh, you know, I mean, you saw yourself, I guess, in mirrors of the day, but seeing yourself was a whole different concept. It was a whole completely different thing where I guess on the superficial level, if you were like a king or a queen or an aristocrat, you could get a portrait painted. Um, But to have the permanence of your image. And so the idea was when somebody figured out how to get exposure uh, times down enough that you could take portraits, that completely changed people's relation to themselves and to what it meant to be alive. And people would dress up for these pictures and it was a once in a lifetime event. And it was very special. And there's all that creepy stuff you can find online of Victorians kind of dressing up their dead kids and that kind of thing to put in photographs to kind of remember um, what they looked like. And so there starts to be this association with this kind of 
permanence of like your physical form, your physical, what you look like being who you are. Um, and so around the same time that happens or a little bit after that happens for various reasons, there's plenty of people going, Oh, if we can take pictures in a few seconds, if we could take pictures really, really quickly in an instant that we could completely freeze time and we could see what happens in an instant and we could see things that the eye has never seen. And so there are scientists and artists working to do that. And in the 1870s, there's an English photographer called Edward Mybridge, who is hired by Leland Stanford of Stanford fame, who owns horses. And Stanford wants to know if his horses at a trot have all their hooves off the ground at any one time. So Mybridge gets this gig and he invents a way to take what they called instantaneous photographs, which is a, a photograph so quickly taken so quickly that you could see clearly the quickest movement um, available. You could see faster than the human eye. And the second he does that, there's a bunch of people, um, including Louis Le Prince, um, who for various reasons kind of connect all these different things in their minds of, oh, so we could take instantaneous photographs, which means we could take a bunch of them. If we can take a picture in a fraction of a second then we could take a bunch of pictures in one second and if we take a bunch of pictures of a bunch of small movements i wonder if we could then animate those to make it look like a continuous thing and they're influenced by stuff like zoetropes and magic lanterns and little optical toys that are really entertaining and different forms of entertainment and they're influenced by people like edison and and promises of the phonograph where you're like oh well if i can if there's someone out there who can capture sound and replay it, then you must be able to capture movement and replay it. And kind of philosophically to go back to that thing about movies and the name of it, that was kind of the key drive. There was this idea that kind of Western civilization had done everything. We built trains, meaning we could go you know, faster than any animal or horse or any natural thing. We built steamships. You could travel overseas that weren't naturally meant to be traveled over. We'd captured kind of people's likeness in a way that wasn't meant to be permanent. And so there was this idea that movement was the soul, movement was life. So if you were able to then capture movement and replay it, then you'd basically captured life and replayed it. And that was, I think, originally not just a way to like entertain people or make some money, but there was this kind of cultural philosophical idea that that would have sent, that would be the culmination of breaking the rules of physics. It kind of makes me it kind of makes me sad because it's so routine for us right now. You and I are looking at each other from thousands and thousands of miles away, and we don't think anything of it. And most of us do that every day now, and we're never going to get to experience the magic of saying, "Wait a minute, that's what I look like when I'm walking around doing something relatively mundane," you know. We miss that enjoyment. Yeah, we do. And like we miss the the kind of like the overwhelming awe of watching something, even as a viewer. And that, that was part of the fun of writing the book was trying to transpose yourself back to this time where it really was kind of magic or alchemy or it was right on that frontier where, where chemistry and engineering were allowing magic to be like a real thing mm. and where so, you could throw basically ghosts on a wall. Yeah, yeah. So... uh and I guess technically then if someone, if you could preserve a movie, someone who had died, you could watch them move again. And that would be a miracle. Um, yeah. And people really early got obsessed with that idea. Like you got stuff where people with photographs and with film got obsessed with, or you could capture ghosts. You could see stuff the eye can't see. Or so there was always a feel of like, you know, of any moving image, you know, over time, it kind of becomes a seance because someone's been dead 75 years and they're here now. Yeah. So who was Louis Le Prince? Your your description of him in the book is he's calm, but unforgettable as well. A bit weird looking and people remembered him. Uh, describe him for us. Who was he? Striking. Like if you imagine a really, really tall kind of middle class Frenchman over six foot, which was really tall for the time. And he wore this extravagant beard style called a hula which kind of like it's kind of like mutton chops that connect 
at the mustache where the clean chin. He um, looked kind of like Chester Arthur, he, I thought, like our president, Chester Arthur. Yeah. Yeah. There's that vibe. And he was, you know, according to people who knew him, quite soft spoken um, and had a variety of interests. And he was kind of one of those guys. He was really interested in the arts and he painted and took photographs and all that stuff. But he'd also studied chemistry and optics and these scientific subjects. And he'd worked as an engineer for uh, uh, an iron forge that belonged to his father-in-law. Um, and he'd worked in entertainment and kind of had all these disparate experiences that when you look at them on paper, they're really all over the place and don't make that much sense unless you're trying to think of someone who would invent something like motion pictures. And so he's really odd in the sense that every experience he had is kind of perfectly tailored to this one very specific end goal. And he fully, Um, he fully expects that this device is going to change the world. Um, Describe what he had come up with. I mean, I know you described where photography was at this point, but his machine, his device, describe it for us as best you can. Um, in the book, I was like, wow, this is actually a really genius experiment to try to put motion to a picture. Yeah, the cool thing, if you try and picture that camera uh, uh, that still exists, in a weird way, it's not that hard to to imagine because it looks very much like a film camera. It's just a box with a lens. And the idea was Le Prince, he was messing around with f- photo equipment one day in his shed because that was one of his hobbies and he had two pictures on glass i think in his hands of the same person and he was manipulating them and they slipped in his hands and they superimposed for a second and it looked like the person in the image was moving and so he starts with this really simple idea that oh, that looked like the person moved. So I guess if I have a bunch of pictures, which I can now take with this instantaneous photo equipment, kind of, then and play them back one on top of the other almost that fast, then it'll look like it's just continually moving. And so he had that basic principle from the start. And what he built to really was just this idea that if you put originally glass frames and then paper rolls and then film as we know it in a, in a belt, and through a camera and moved it really, really quickly past the lens with a light exposing it very quickly, then you would be able to connect stitch shows back up and project them and run them past the lens again the other way. And it would throw the same images back up on the wall. And the thing that was cool about him is not only does he come up with this like years before the Lumiere brothers or years before Thomas Edison even considers it, but even when those guys got into motion pictures, the idea was this is a toy this is a product we can make some money from it we'll see if the public likes it whereas le prince was obsessive and evangelical about it right away he would sketch stuff out that looked like a cinema he would tell his wife like this will replace kings and it'll help diplomacy and politics and we can teach people things with it and you can see parts of the world you've never seen before and he was making lists of stuff he could film like oh circus acts and buffalo bill and travelogues and he was already talking about, this is 80, mid-1880s, talking about, you know, even if I have to hand paint them, I can make them in color. We can put sound to them. Mm. We should project them, not just like put them on a little optical toy, but we should project them and it should be projected so the people are the size they would be in real life. And so not only did he come up with the technology, but he had a vision for the medium and what it would mean. Imagine that thinking as as, TV would help. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, like it's it's mad, but it's also yeah, you know, it's 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 not only mad looking back, you and I knowing about yeah, TV right. and all this stuff, but it's mad. <laughs> he had no frame of reference for this stuff. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like he's inventing this whole medium out of something that's never happened before. And it's bizarrely a lot like the the picture house, like going to the cinema. Yeah. Um, um amazing. Um So describe the experiment that he does on this landmark day, August, uh, I'm sorry, October 14th, 1888. I was proud because I used to work in Rochester and he used some equipment from Rochester. I think the film was from the Eastman Kodak company. 
um, which is a company that uh, is still there, uh, at least in some form. Um, but it's an amazing thing he does. He has people walking around the lawn uh, of, of his lawn and he takes video of them doing that. Um, and I, I went on YouTube and I'm pretty sure that I found the real video, but I wasn't sure because it looked incredibly high quality for what I had expected. It was amazing. Um, I assume that's really it because it said it was really it, right? Trust everything you read on the internet. Um, but it described yeah. the experiment he did that day and and uh, and what we would see if we went onto YouTube and searched for it. Sure. So he, he spent years working on trying to make this machine work. And basically the, the problem he had was you had to run so many images through the camera at a time, 10, 15, 20 a second, that if you used what people used at a time to take photographs, which was either glass plates or paper, it wouldn't work. The glass plates would break and the paper would rip or things would catch fire. Um, and that was kind of his main problem. And then in 1887, 1888, um, George Eastman, who's got Kodak up in Rochester, as you were saying, and this guy called John Carbett in Philadelphia come up with this thing called celluloid, which is basically flexible plastic that you could use for film to like put chemicals on it, expose an image, and it was flexible but hard, and it wouldn't rip, and it wouldn't tear. And so Le Prince and others get to buy these rolls and load them in the camera, and that was kind of the last hurdle to prove what he could do. And so he decided to prove what the camera could do that he would do something really simple. He'd get his in-laws and his son and a family friend in the family home in Leeds and to just go stand outside on the lawn and basically kind of do silly walks in a circle. Um, And there's a bit of thought to it. Like there was this idea that if you have several people and they're walking in depth, then you can show that this is all taken from one point of view and all this technical stuff you want to demonstrate. But really it just kind of looks like a home video. Like it looks really modern because it looks you like the, the kind of silly little thing video that we all make, right? Yeah, that you have on your phone of just right. people goofing around in the backyard. And the contact, some of the contact sheets kind of survive and they're numbered and it suggests that he took kind of a long sequence of it. Um, but only about two, 2.8 seconds. I think it was um, 20 the first film. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. And yeah. I think he was going, you know, this is where people guesstimate but his machine was working kind of nine to 14 frames a second. And so the science museum, probably what you saw that looks good. The science museum in England um, years ago worked really hard to restore those frames and put them back together. Um, And you can still see some damage on the right where the, the, the negatives kind of ripped and stuff, but the quality is yeah. Crazy. Much better than you expect. I mean, truly remarkable. Yeah. Yeah, you can kind of see facial expressions. And there's another film he took a few weeks later. Um, And we know these dates, sorry, in part because one of the people, his mother-in-law in in that first film, which is called The Round Hay Garden Scene, which was taken in October 1888. And as far as we know, is the oldest film in existence. One of the reasons we can date it that specifically is there's a letter from somebody else who was there on that day, who's in the footage saying we took it on that Sunday after church and Le Prince's mother-in-law died a few weeks later. She actually collapsed from illness that day. And so, you know, it was taken in October, 1888 because one of the people in it was dead within a few weeks, which is kind of a tragic. Thank goodness. I have this video of them. I can preserve them forever now. Yeah. It's kind of a tragic, not only does it date the film, but it also kind of underlines the value of film, this idea that, well, she's gone now, but she's still dancing around here. Um, But he took a film of Leeds Bridge um, a few weeks later, just he went up in one of the towers, took a video peering down at the bridge. And there's only a few seconds of that to survive still, but like, you know, you can see smoke coming out of a guy's pipe as he walks across the bridge and you can see, you know, horses manes as they move across. And like, so, when people dismiss Le Prince and say, well, no, Edison and the Lumiere brothers um, came up with film first, it's kind of based on two things. One of them is Le Prince never got to have a paying screening. He never got to have a customer. And as capitalists, even though Le Prince had patents and had the stuff and the camera survived, we kind of subconsciously have decided if somebody doesn't sell something, then it doesn't exist. But also it's because only a few seconds of those frames survive. And so people go, oh, well, it should have, you know, we don't have a 20 second film. We don't have a 30 second film. And it's an arbitrary 
um, kind of this distinction. What's more interesting to me is that if you look at people doing attempts around that time, he's kind of the only one where the films look that good. Where you you know kind of look at them and go, okay, that's movement, that's life, that's not jangly, it's not dark. It's a film. Um, what was the reaction of people who saw this for the first time in the in in in, um, in the contemporary day as opposed to today? Baking from our childhood just sticks in the memory, doesn't it? We never set off on holiday without piles of Tupperware. And there'd always be Bakewell Slice, Flapjacks and tray baked scones in the boot. Do you not do that, Lisa? No. (laughs) Sadly, I do not stack uh, the Tupperware in the back of the car when we go off on holiday. Welcome to Small Ways to Live Well, a new podcast from The Simple Things magazine. Season two is a pick-me-up tonic that helps us make the shift from winter to spring. A six-week suggestion box full of things to note, notice and enjoy about the season. Search for Small Ways to Live Well on your podcast app. Amazed. And so one of the things is, you know, people, I don't know if we've actually even mentioned this this far. People might know or not notice, but one of the reasons we don't know Le Prince is he vanished mysteriously kind of soon after this. It's one of the great Victorian mysteries. Um, and so his son then went around trying to collect evidence and memories of him. And he collected kind of dozens of sworn testimonies and affidavits from people who'd worked with Le Prince, or come by the workshop or had seen it demonstrated. And you read all these papers that people, you know, did in front of notaries in courts of law, whatever, and signed. Um, where people say, you know, I wandered into the workshop and there were just, you know, shadows walking around the walls. Or, you know, I came into the place and there was something happening that looked like real life up there. Um, and there's just complete amazement because people were able to comprehend something like a magic lantern or a slideshow where the movement was limited and it was quite clearly fake and it was on a smaller kind of projection. But the idea that this is people at the scale of people um, was really hard to comprehend. And some of the issues Le Prince had with patent offices, for instance, was he would send in his paperwork to get a patent and people would tell him the projector and the camera, it sounds like two different things. You got to apply for two different things. And you'd have to explain, no, the whole idea is they work together. It's not a magic lantern and a photo camera. I'm inventing a whole new thing. And he would have to go in person to patent offices um, to explain to people how this worked and to have people tell him that sounds like witchcraft. Um, and for him to go, no, it's actually like fairly simple. But one has to work with the other. And so he had people were amazed when they saw it and it was, but it was such an, a, a, a kind of, I guess, specific thing that when you explained it to people, it didn't always get across. Um, so what happens next? So um, you say that he disappeared. What do we know about how and why he disappeared? Um, and then I guess the other important question is who else is working on film cameras And how does it all collide? But I guess start with the disappearance of Louis Le Prince. Yeah, it kind of all blends in. So he makes that first film in October 1888. And there are letters, you know, from him back home saying, I've done it, I've finished it. People saying, I saw it, it works. Um, But he disappears in September of 1890. So there's a couple of years um, between the film and when he disappears. And in those couple of years, from the evidence we have from his letters, from the paperwork, from the testimony, he essentially started working on making this prototype commercially kind of viable and his family's in the U S he's in England because that's where his resources were. Um, He demonstrates the projector to um, the secretary of the opera in Paris, maybe to get a contract. He makes all these plans. And by 1890, he's making plans to return to New York where his family is, where he wants to premiere moving pictures He's convinced America is the place where the future is happening. He, his wife leases this place called the Jamel Mansion, which is uptown in New York, which, you know, massive historical cachet back then. It was where George Washington had his first meeting. She pays a ton of money for this kind of crumbling down mansion. 
so they can use the cabinet room as a screening room and they renovate it and he packs up all his stuff and he goes back to France to visit family. Um, it's mainly his brother and his nieces and nephew um, to say, I'm going to America. I've finished. Um, this is me saying goodbye. And this is me also wrapping up, you know, our mother's died. There's paperwork, there's property, there's inheritance. We need to wrap that stuff up. And so he goes to Dijon in the South of France, where his brother lives for a long weekend in September of 1890. Um, and according to his brother and his brother's family, they have four days together. It's very enjoyable. And then Le Prince gets back on the train to Paris. And in Paris, he'll be met by um, friends from England who were also touring France. And then they would all travel back to England together. Um, and so what we have from the record and the testimony is the Prince's family see him off on the train. They see him bored. They see him. They know what train he gets on to Paris. And by the time that train pulls into Paris, his friends wait for him at the station and he doesn't turn up and he doesn't get off the train. Um, and so the English friends decide, you know what? Well, he probably got held up. It, it would happen a lot in those days. He didn't have texting or WhatsApp or a phone or a, so he probably got held up. We'll go ahead without him. He'll join us in England. So they go in England, go to England. Sorry. Um, in the meanwhile, his brother in France just carries on with his life. You know, I, I, he's probably on his way back to England now. Uh, Le Prince's wife, Lizzie, and his kids, they're in New York thinking, you know, it takes 10 days or whatever to get here on the steamship. <laughs> um, he'll probably be here in a couple of weeks. And so everybody thinks he's somewhere he's not, but he's somehow disappeared somewhere on this train journey. And so by the time Lizzie, the 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 wife in New York, writes back to, to Europe going, um, so he hasn't turned up or answered my letters. And the guys in England go, Oh, I, I thought he was in France. And so they wired a guy in France and the brother goes, oh, no, I thought he was with, with you. By the time everybody realizes no one knows where he is, it's been like six weeks or something. And it's basically a cold case right off the start. <laughs> because right. he's vanished off the face of the earth and no one realized for a month and a half. Uh, and while um, he's vanishing, there are people making their own cameras and proceeding um, or at least they say they're their own cameras, right? But uh, you say that one of the devices looks strikingly similar to what he had invented. Yeah. So one of the key parts of this is in that kind of last year or two before his disappearance, this big fish kind of enters the race for motion pictures. And that would be Thomas Edison, um, who even then is a notorious kind of shyster and thief in inventing communities. And so Thomas Edison and this guy who works for him called William Dixon try and figure out how to make a moving picture camera and Dixon's a photographer. He kind of gets it. Edison has no idea how this all works. He just had a meeting with Edward Mybridge, that photographer who took the pictures of the horses where Mybridge said, Hey, you know what? I've got this photography. You've got the phonograph. Imagine if we could put them together, then we could have movement and talking. And Edison tells Mybridge, I don't know. I don't have the time. And then basically the second Mybridge is out of the room, he goes, okay, guys, this is what we're going to do, but not with him. We're doing it ourselves. And so they try and work on it. They have no idea really how to do it. And then Le Prince disappears. And Le Prince, it's important to remember, he holds all the patents to motion picture technology. He's got the first motion picture patent in America, in France, in England, in Austria, in Belgium, in Italy, in all these places. He's trying to cover himself legally. And... A patent basically gives you the right to be the only person to do something commercially for like 14 years or something, but it also gets published publicly and anybody can look it up. And there's a guy, again, Thomas Edison, who's notorious for having a library full of every published patent that comes out. And he has people cut out the interesting ones and show them to him. And he kind of almost openly admits to oh yeah, sometimes I'll see something where someone's 90% of the way and I'll take it the last 10% and then it's mine. And so what happens is Le Prince disappears in September of um, 1890. And in just a few months later, um, his, his wife opens the New York Sun that morning and on the front page is advertised Thomas Edison's newest wonder. He can make moving images and project them on a wall life-size. And as she's reading this, 
she's like, this is exactly my husband's machine. This works exactly the way it would. She's got friends sending messages going, oh, I didn't know Louis was working with Thomas Edison. That's great. Wow. You know, go, going, oh, yeah, that's brilliant. He must have sold it to Edison. And so she becomes convinced almost immediately that my husband disappeared. No one knows how. But who benefits this guy who's notoriously dishonest, who now suddenly is, is shelling the exact same invention? And she does something about it. They go to court. They do eventually. So because this is another one of the tragic things about this is because the prince was missing, but not dead. Right. It kind of Te froze all his property. Technically speaking, technically speaking. Yeah. Legally speaking, which is really important. At the right. time that meant you'd have to wait seven years or until a body was found to access his property, which meant his intellectual property as well, which means that for seven years from when he's missing, goes missing, sorry, his family can't do anything with the patents because they belong to him and he might be alive somewhere and he might not want you to use them. And so in this period of seven years where they can't touch his invention, can't exploit it or use it, Edison comes out with his thing. The Lumiere brothers come out with their thing. Other people come out with their things. And Lizzie the Prince and her kids are walking around going, we have no money, no money. Louis is gone. Everything we've sunk into this dream as a family has disappeared. But these other people are using what he came up with, as we saw it, and they're making fortunes. And everybody's going, exactly as Louis predicted, this is a game changer. This is, you know, the first kind of 20th century futuristic invention thing. It completely changes the world. And, and we can't do anything about it. So at the end of the seven years, in a kind of roundabout way, they do something about it. And they end up in court um, facing Thomas Edison, really. Um, not on their own dime, because they can't afford it, but because somebody else comes to them, somebody else who's a film company, and says, look, Thomas Edison is trying to put everybody else out of business. He's claiming he not only owns his own cameras, but he owns the complete medium of motion pictures, that anybody who's making a film anywhere is exploiting an idea that's his. And we've gone through the paperwork, and we've realized your... Louis Le Prince actually has the first patent for moving images. So if you can come to court and talk about it and we can show that, well, the, the Edison can't own the medium because somebody else came up with it before him, then we can kind of knock him when. And so the Le Princes figured this is the only opportunity we'll ever have it's because one of the things about Edison was that he had a battery of lawyers, J.P. Morgan funded lawyers, where he could just drive people out of business in a very modern kind of corporate yeah. barren kind of way. And so they figured this is the only way we can go up against him. So we'll collect all this evidence and we'll go and prove that, you know, Le Prince was the first one to come up with this. And even if he can't get the credit and can't get all the money, at least we can keep that guy from having it because he, as they saw it, he nicked it. Now it's up to you whether you want to disclose the results of this case, uh, so we don't. Uh, so people still want to go out and buy your book. Um, that's totally up to you. I also want to leave it up to you to decide to to on whether you want to say what you found about the actual disappearance. That's up to you also. But I want to at least have you describe the potential theories, because um, some of those have been out there on Wikipedia and and whatever else, some other. Um, yeah avenues uh what are the potential theories of where he went and why he went and um it's up to you if you want to say what you discovered uh that you have in your book sure there are a few main theories right so there's the edison one which is you know thomas said which is the kind of the sexy one that people want to believe in um which is thomas edison had this guy killed to steal his invention um, there's the theory that somebody else who's not Thomas Edison, who was also a rival, might have had this guy killed to steal his invention. Um, there are popular theories um, grounded in some fact that Le Prince was in financial difficulty because he'd sunk all his money into this work and it was embarrassing and his family was going to go bankrupt. And so he, you know, died by suicide and, and um, took his own life. There are similar theories that for all the same reasons, um, he actually went and started um, a new life somewhere else. Um, 
there are theories that he might have fallen you know foul to muggers or criminals in paris that he actually got off the train but missed his friends and in paris at the time was known to be quite lawless and people would end up in the seine river quite frequently um there are theories that he might have been attacked on the train there are theories that he might have been that his brother-in-law uh, Lizzie's brother was in financial difficulty and wanted to exploit the invention and so might have done something to him. Um, those are kind of the main ones. And there's there's a lot of online sleuthing about it. There's people who have bits of evidence um, that they think contributes to this theory or that theory. There's people who have really specific theories. There's one French historian who, um, in his case, with no proof whatsoever, would just tell people that Le Prince was... Um, gay and had decided to you know run away with his boyfriend and lived in Chicago until he was like eight years old and with no evidence whatsoever um you know there there's a famous body that props up at some point that may or may not be him um that gets shared around the internet a lot um and so there's all these theories that I some of them are more valid than others and the valid ones kind of run through the narrative um in a true crime way um and I lay out my stall for a very, very specific one that we researched really, really thoroughly that I feel really strongly about. Um, and that, you know, make my case at the end of the book because I love this idea that like people can kind of try and solve it themselves and then see where we stand. Um, and the interesting thing about it is I've not had anybody really challenge it so far. Mm. Mm. I've, I've, I've had people go, oh, I guess so. <laughs> or, oh, but not being able to go, well, no, that doesn't make sense. So, no, I don't buy that. Um, so I feel pretty good about it. Um, and I like not spoiling it because I think some yeah, of the fun, yeah, obviously, yeah. is chasing it around. The, the court case is different in a weird way because the court case, like we all know that Louis Le Prince isn't remembered in history books. So we all figure he must have lost somehow. Um, it's how it gets there that's really interesting in the sense that they kind of didn't lose most of the way. Edison lost most of the way. And then he pulled some really shady, corrupt shenanigans to get an appeal he didn't deserve and to backtate a bunch of paperwork and to fake some paperwork and kind of win when he never should have. The The interesting thing thematically about that court case is it's literally the court case that leads to us having Hollywood in the sense that after all these appeals and after all this stuff, Thomas Edison comes out the winner and he decides anybody who's making films I'm going to either, you know, bully for a license fee. I'm going to sue out of business. Mm -hmm. And films at the time were made in New York mostly. And so he starts putting all these independent producers out of business. He starts hassling all these um, foreign companies to the point where all the American filmmakers go, we can't deal with this guy, you know, showing Pinkerton detectives to our door to sue us. So where are we <laughs> going to go? Where can we go to make films where he can't reach us? Is there a is there um, a, a modern day parallel to Thomas Edison and this technique of pu putting people out of business and suing them to oblivion? Yeah, but that's I a side think question. It's just so com I, I think it's just so common now. Yeah, I think that's what everybody does. <laughs> like I, it's just like, what we do. People think, yeah, people like you know. I get people going, "Oh, Thomason was he was such a prick. He was an awful person. He was a thief. He was a this. He was that." And I'm kind of like, the, the more I read about him, the more I felt like, I feel like he's just your average Fortune 500 CEO guy now. Like, that's what you do. You break strikes and you sue people into the ground and you, you know, break unions and you, uh, you make uh, it lie impossible about to what compete. a big deal you are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, exactly. Uh, so the, the college professor question is, like, why does this matter? Why does this story have to be unearthed now? So tell us, Paul, what is the most, uh, what is the reason you want this story told? And what can we all take away from this story to our own lives? See, I have the answer that the college professor wouldn't like, which is my first answer is like, it's a great story. Like, it's just a really <laughs> right. great story. There's a little bit about me that it's fun if you get to right a, a wrong and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter in the sense of like, I'm not sending a war criminal to court, right? but to the degree that it matters who did something first and to the degree that it matters that history is made up of our family histories, right? The Le Prince family 
has a family history, his descendants have this family heritage that is either not known or people dismiss. And, you know, for me growing up in France, anytime you mentioned someone other than the Lumiere brothers might have invented film, it was like talking about somebody who's either a crackpot or a liar or, you know, self-aggrandizing. And so the Le Princes, I think, for a long time were treated in that way as if they were liars or they were grifters or they were making something up that wasn't real. When not only is it real, but it's really astonishing that, like in Le Prince's case, the films are there, the camera's there, the projector's there, he had the patents, he had the witnesses. Like there's really no way to argue he didn't make this stuff because he made this stuff. It's right there, it exists. And you, you know, you even have people in England who like will run modern film through an exact replica of the camera. And they're like, yeah, it works. You can use it. You can literally use this as a film camera. And so trying to restore that is kind of nice, you know, kind of trying to, 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 to set that right. But then there's also a thing I think about, I guess the way we think about movies and, and, you know, he was someone who thought about them as an art form and as a medium straight away and started with a home film. And, and it wasn't a, a, kind of industrialist corporate endeavor from the start. Um, and then there's a little bit of a through line through the book that really interests me, which is the way we think about innovation and the way we write history, really, because we think the kind of basic assumption about Le Prince is we don't remember him because he vanished. And so we don't have the evidence that he did what he said he did. But the evidence is there. The, the, the reason we don't remember him is partly because as I said, the way we write history is quite heavily influenced by capitalist kind of principles. You know, if you sell something, it exists. If you don't, like there's a guy who researches the prince who's got this great line about, you know, if someone makes a film, but no one buys a ticket to see it, does the film really exist? And it's really that kind of thing that he was dealing with. And also this patriotic nationalistic thing about how we write history. Like the prince was very modern in a sense that he was French, but born in the German part of France. And then he worked and lived in England and then he was naturalized American. And so no one claimed him. And to a great degree, when people wrote the history of the birth of the movies, which was a very deliberate PR thing in the 1930s, kind of post-World War I, um, the Lumiere brothers kind of were championed by the French because they were French and seemed to represent something about Fren French identity. And Thomas Edison was you know, kind of championed himself and was championed by the American press because he seemed to represent something about the way Americans should think about themselves. Um, and so hopefully all of those things are kind of interesting ways to reframe, you know, either film and how it was born or innovation and how we think about it and um, and kind of wrap those all up in an, in an entertaining story. Mm. Um, are his descendants yeah. still around? Yeah, they're around. They're mostly in Memphis, Tennessee. Oh, do you um, talk to them? Because I did, yeah, and they were great and they were super helpful and they disagreed with my conclusions to the mm -hmm. end of the book for the longest time, but in a really respectful kind of like, well, you're coming at it in good faith um, um, kind of way. And I think I wore them down in the end where they might <laughs> still disagree with it, but that it's hard to answer, but they're great. And you know, part of the thing with, with Le Prince is he disappears and in the court case and the toll of it destroys almost his whole family. Um, except he had one son who got away from it all um, called Joseph, um, who's weirdly a big deal in um, epidemiology kind of circles in history because he popularized the use, of, the use of mosquito nets in the Americas to get rid of malaria and, and those kinds of disease diseases. So he's quite well known in that field, but he settled in Memphis and so his line of the family um, survives um, and, and, you know, has either kept papers and kept documents or donated them to museums, um, you know, and, and as a nonfiction writer, they were brilliant in the sense they were really helpful, but, but kind of never guiding or nudging in hmm. one direction or the other. Uh, um, yeah. um, uh, what advice would he give to today's movie makers? What yeah. I don't, uh, that's a really good question. I don't know. Cause uh, again, one of the fascinating things about him is because he went missing and because there are gaps in his story, it's really easy to idealize him. Um, you know, you, you can go Thomas Edison was an awful person because we have all the evidence that he was an awful person. 
Whereas Le Prince, the second someone disappears or they're an underdog or something, you, you kind of just want to paint them as flawless. I think from the films he was making and the way he made them, I don't know. I get the sense he would have been kind of very humanist about it and very entrepreneurial about it. Um, and so I think today's filmmakers, I think his attitude would have been to just like make the films, you know, make the films. Don't worry about the distribution of the films. He was very technologically um, forward thinking, like he wanted to make 3D films and he wanted to make. Um, so he probably would have thought outside um, the box of like how something is distributed or projected or. Um, what can what can today's what can today's movie makers learn from him? It's a good question. I think if you look at whatever survives of his kind of work and the way he thought about films, I think, I don't know. I think we're obsessed about scale and narrative and spectacle now. And he was very Victorian in a sense that kind of like capturing life and capturing humanity and conveying that kind of thing was the most important thing and felt like progress. You know, he had this stuff he would tell his family of like, with this medium, you'll be able to show someone how someone else lives on the other side of the world. You'll be able to, like he was convinced this would end war because who would send their kid to war if they could see footage of what actually happened in war? Um, oh, I, oh, so I wish that were the case. And that's the thing. We might learn all those things from him. But there's also this idea like we've moved so past that. He might just learn about deep fakes and just have a breakdown. Um. So you are into writing about movies. Uh, your other book, a Kim Jong-il production, looks fascinating to me. And I am definitely going to be reading that book. That's for sure. Um, uh, why is the written word a great way to explore the captured image? I think because it gives you a bit more time. It gives you a bit more time to like, I guess, digest context and... and um kind of see where it all fits like I like to think of these books as kind of cultural history really but with a hook and hopefully you read them as a narrative and you read them as you know the first book is is a thriller kind of thing and this is kind of true crime but that narrative gives you the cultural history as you go mm -hmm. um and it's volume right it's kind of like uh, the a Kim Jong-il production is about this these South Korean filmmakers who were kidnapped in North Korea by Kim Jong-il in the 70s before Kim Jong-il ran the country and before he ran the country he ran the propaganda department because he was a massive film nerd um and so I remember reading about this story and putting stuff together about it and and you know like my first instinct was like if I make a documentary I got two hours there's going to be so much I'm gonna have to cut out and lose and get rid of and and um and I think that's the first impulse right if you give me 400 pages I can give you so much more than I can give you in two hours with some of these stories. But also, I don't know if you if you put some of these stories about film on film, then there's something prescriptive about them. There's something kind of ready made and finished about them. But if there's stories about film, that you've got to sit and read on your own and partly picture on your own that there's something more intimate in that reconnecting to, to film history or film imagery. Um, than just watching it. Uh, you're also a journalist and a screenwriter. Um, how do you manage the three distinct styles of writing in your own head? How do you pick one up and drop two off and then pick the next one up and drop the other two off? They're different enough, which is the first thing. Um, and I do them at different rates. Like I don't write kind of reported pieces of journal like I'm a freelancer I don't staff for anybody so I only you know the last reported piece I wrote for someone was in January and we're now in October so it's pretty rare and so what I'll do is I'll take you know a couple of weeks or days or whatever it is that that the piece needs and just focus on that um and then with screenplays you know I write them quickly and it takes four weeks something like that and it's and it's uh, it, it's much more scaffolding in a weird way than a book and it's much more immediate and so I can kind of okay I'll do this on the book in the morning and then I can spend three hours on the screenplay because it comes out much quicker and if anything if you overthink a screenplay then you kind of kill it um, 
you know, to the degree they can overthink a book. And in books, you know, they take me three years. They take a long time. So just by virtue of, you know, trying not to get bored of them year one, and then you're like, crap, I got so much more left to do, then it's good to have stuff to change it up and to have little um, um, changes. But, you know, I really try and, and kind of prioritize the big project. And so I'll work on the book stuff in the morning and I'll switch to something else. But they're different kind of dialects at different yeah. speeds. So it's kind of helpful to get to switch rather than an encumbrance. Uh, what's next for you? May I ask that question? You don't have to answer it, I guess. But yeah, of course. May I ask what's uh, next? No, that's cool. We announced it, so I can't answer it, which is cool. Uh, it's a book about um, three young guys, fresh out of film school, in the case of two of them, who were buddies um, in 1969. Um coming into a Hollywood industry that's dying and moribund and all the old studio heads have gone and the business is at such a loss that like Paramount Pictures are even, you know, considering selling their lot to the local cemetery so they can just put gravestone in there. Like the business is dead. And these three guys come in and they're young and they're nerdy and they're excited and they're friends and they're going to change the world. And so two of them go up to San Francisco to start a company that's going to rival Hollywood studios. Um, and the two guys who went up to Hollywood um, were called Francis Ford Coppola and George Lucas. Um, and um, they started with this big kind of dream of how they were going to change Hollywood. Um, and then what was one company ended up two, and they had a massive falling out. And in the process, kind of invented what modern Hollywood was. And whatever um, happened to the so I two like guys? I'm just kidding. Yeah, exactly. They they sounded promising. <laughs> Did but anyone like ever see their movies? As... <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I like to think of it as kind of like succession, but with nerds in 1969, California. There you go. Um, Paul Fisher, the author of The Man Who Invented Motion Pictures, a true tale of obsession, murder, and the movies. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much for having me. That was fun. Check out the book. Check out his website, paulfisherauthor.com. He's on Twitter at 10 cents 77, 10 cents 77. I want to invite listeners to our Patreon page to ask for your support in keeping the show going. Go to patreon.com slash Axelbank History. We will donate part of your contributions to a charity for children's literacy. And thank you for listening to Axelbank Reports History and Today, conversations with America's top nonfiction authors and why their books matter right now. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Axelbank History. We update those with clips from the show, guest announcements, and book recommendations. See you next time. Thanks.